lost deep in the pages of your Bible are the books that are unmentioned, unheard of, and unread. They are the forgotten books of the Bible. Hey, welcome to Your Church Friends Podcast. I am Chris. And I'm Mjordlik. And I was going to have you open up the show, but you decided you didn't want to. Yeah, because small talk is <laughs> difficult. Because <laughs> anybody listening ever just like, wow, that guy really struggles in the beginning and keeps struggling <laughs> till the end. It's almost like I have to say, hey, this is what we're going to talk about at the beginning, so you're ready. But you don't. You just are like, hey, I'm going to randomly spring a question on you. Well, it makes it fun. But what gets me though is when you're like, hey, here's a pop culture thing. I'm like, all right, I know I've seen that movie or I know that I'm experiencing these things. My brain just doesn't hold on to it, yeah. which then just makes me feel lame because I'm like, I actually did know something about that or I enjoyed that. I just have nothing to say on it spontaneously. Yeah, I guess that and I don't really ask enough of the pop culture stuff that I know you would be able to answer easily enough. Yeah, I don't know. It's well, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole of me and pop culture stuff. <laughs> Speaking of rabbit holes, we're back in Jude. Yeah, yeah, we are. You know what? We didn't do a Jude. What? Is because with everybody else, I'm like, hey, do you know what this name means? Did we? I feel like we've done that with pretty much everyone except for Jude. I thought I did that with Jude. Jude, short for Judah, which I don't think we've talked about that. Well, if and, we haven't, go for it. Okay, so Jude, short for Judah, which just means praised. Yeah, I did. I said to be praised or, or praised one. Okay. <laughs> but yes, praise. And, and it's, it is a really cool name as we're looking at Jude and, and like you said, Judah, right? To be praised. Yeah. Interesting. I know that we've talked about Judah and just kind of, was that when we were talking about like the lineage of Jesus and stuff? I don't know. We talk all kinds of stuff on the yes. show and off the show and like through coming through mm -hmm. Judah and stuff. So I know that we've talked about Judah. I just didn't remember. I'm like, hey, here's our baby name meanings <laughs> for, <laughs> for these books of the Bible. This season. Maybe that's what we should have called this season. The baby, the, the baby names of the Bible. Well, honestly, yeah. like that is when I'm just trying to do the quick way. I, mm -hmm. I search it on the internet real quick and everything is just like, what's the meaning of this? I was like, baby namepedia. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Whatever. That does show up a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, well, I guess that's quicker than opening up Logos and clicking on the thing. And, and then finding which one you need to get into to get the meaning of the name. Yeah. yeah. That's why sometimes on the names, like you have a lot more intense of a description. <laughs> and I'm just like, yeah, or it could just be a cute little kid. <laughs> Did you know no one's named this anymore in the last decade? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, let's get into this book. See, that's why I don't open the show. Do you see where that yeah. went real quick? <laughs> <laughs> that went bad fast. All right. It was like, all right, we'll just, we'll just turn off the podcast now. I thought we were talking something interesting. Let's let Chris do that from now on. All right. Um, <laughs> so we got to at least, I think, verse four last week. We got to at least verse four. So I think my goal for this one is to get us to verse at least 11 and just the way of Cain. And then next week we'll cover the rest. And the week after that, we will then finish off with, I guess, what we've been dubbing behind the scenes as the pastoral episode. If we were to teach this, how would we teach this to a congregation? A more practical insight yeah, or for just your own life. What I've gotten yeah. for, for myself. Like, how does it speak to me yeah. on that? More like that kind of stance. Yeah. So that's hopefully the goal. Um, just a quick breakdown of the forgotten book of Jude. We have the greeting is verse 1 to 2. The purpose of the writing is 3 to 4. Uh, judgment on the false teachers is 5 to 16. And then the exhortation to persevere is 17 through 23. And then our friendly little word of doxology is 24 through 25. And again, we're looking at uh, the purpose behind it is that Jude is warning against false teachers. They're wrecking havoc in the congregation, and, and it really has to stop. And uh, that the way that the false teachers were coming in is that they were, uh, he says they have slipped in, they have crept in secretly. And uh, so they just kind of slid in. They weren't really recognized. They didn't make a big old show about what they were doing to begin with. They seemed to be part of the group, and then they started spreading in their false doctrines. Yeah, and that's the thing, right, to where, like, the most believable lies are mostly true. Right. You know, you know that yeah. kind of thing? It's just like when something's just outright wrong, it tends to get rejected. But it's kind of one of those dangers, and this is kind of a point, I guess, for that pastoral thing. But uh, just to be aware that it's not too difficult to hang around the church or Christianity and learn the talk and kind of see how things operate. 
and to fake those things. Mm -hmm. Like you can put on the appearance and you can see that even in, in like Jesus day. It was like, hey, they're like clean on the outside, but on the in th inside things are screwed up when talking about the Pharisees. And that's kind of the same thing here. It's like, hey, they have the appearance maybe, but something in them is taking it astray. Yeah. And I think really what it comes down to is like they came in somewhat trustworthy of sources, almost like they were a, a false teacher will come in as no, he knows what he's talking about. Right. So they're seen as almost authoritative in the subject or field that they're talking in. I really, really like watching wrestling. And um, I, so at home, I'll talk to Justine about certain things because she'll she'll watch it here and there with me. But then she doesn't watch the whole 10 hours of wrestling that's on a week now. Back maybe, gosh, five years ago, there was a group of guys called Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano. And they worked together as a tag team. They were independent wrestlers, came into the big stage of WWE and earned a contract just because they were really hard workers and they put on great matches. Like they weren't supposed to be there. And each of them has had success in wrestling in WWE since then. Uh, but when they first started, they were a tag team called DIY and I loved them, put on great matches. And one day we're driving and I was talking to Justine about the whole story that they weren't supposed to be there. These are the guys who shouldn't make it. They're smaller. They're not the big six foot, 300 pounds of muscle guys. They're like probably realistically five, six, 170 pounds, skinny guys. And I said, the cool thing about them though, is they're, it's a father and son tag team. And she was like, oh, that's really cool. And I was like, yeah, and you know, Tomas is the dad, Gar Johnny Gargano's the son because he looked way older. And she was like, oh, that's super cool. So then I just said it like offhand, just messing with her, right? And we're then watching it with some other friends. And she's like, oh, that's the father-son tag team. And everyone looked at her like, what? And she was like, yeah, Chris said that, that their father, that's a father and son. And I was like, no, I was just joking with you. And everyone laughs at her, right? Because now she looked foolish. Uh, the whole point being that, you know, when the false teachers come in, they'll slip in something like that because it just seems believable mm -hmm. <laughs> when i was listening like so which one's a false tito <laughs> false teacher uh tomato or gar gargantuan <laughs> like whatever they're called <laughs> and i was just like where's the story going but yeah. no with that i have the same thing with delilah and then we can get back in the book but like because for me sometimes when i'm looking at things like i just try to make sense of it in my head but then i can also make sense of things and put it out there in a way that sounds right right and delilah's several years ago was like can you just preface things that are like that with well, this is my opinion, or this is what I think. It's like, because sometimes you say things and it does sound right. And then I might go and repeat that to people. And she's like, <laughs> so can you just tell me when it's just something that you've come up with? Because yeah, it's really easy to make something sound right to people who don't know anything about it, like you were saying. It's really easy to hook the gullibility of people. And I think that's why Judah's even writing this book. Like what his purpose is behind it is like, hey, the church, you need to take a stand on what the truth is. But in order to do that, you have to know what the truth is. And if you don't know what the truth is, then when someone comes in and says, oh, here's a, a vision I had or a dream I had of a new revelation, then it comes in and, and it just messes up the whole thing. Uh, but he's warning against all of that stuff. Yeah. So be truthful to your wife. So that's what I'm getting. Yeah. At. That's our point of this episode. <laughs> yeah. No, false teachers. Absolutely. That goes through. But then that's what's weird. If you go like the point of this is false teachers all the way through. If you relate it to over in Second Peter as well, which we were recommending to, to read the two as a pair, they really line up. But then there's an interesting thing, and that's where kind of we stopped last time. We're going to get into this time. We're talking about false teachers, but then the where Jude takes it in these verses goes, in the same way these dreamers defile their bodies, reject authority, and slander glorious beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he disputed with the devil over the body of Moses, didn't presume to bring a slanderous charge against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. It's like, okay, false teachers, hold on. Now we're talking about the archangel Michael fighting with satan over moses's body what does that have to do with false teachers and it keeps going woe to them they've traveled the path of cain rushed headlong into the air of balaam they've perished in korah's rebellion like what is this still false teacher like how mm -hmm. are these things supporting this and then goes on even further and says so enoch the seventh from adam prophesied about them and it's like these are some very interesting ways of proving your point about false teachers so i think that's where we're going to spend some time kind of well, what are these events? How can we understand them so that we can get what Jude is talking about here? Because he's talking to an audience that he could just say this sentence and it made sense to them. Yeah, that, that's the part that I catch. So when you're looking at verse five, it says, though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. So that's kind of kicking off the first whole segment of what we were talking about this this long list of 
things that were being brought up and brought up and what does this have to do with it? But that opening part is, although you already know all this, I want to remind you. So none of the things he's saying comes off as, wait, what? To the audience, Mm -hmm. where we now many, 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 many years later and removed from that, look at that and go, wait, what now? So in that, you already know this, this is God taking his people out of Egypt. We're like, yeah, we read Exodus. We know about that. And then at the very, well, somewhere through that, when he talks about Cain and Balaam and Korah, it's like, we know about that because read the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. But where we get into even verse six, which I didn't reference a second ago, the angels who didn't stay within their own domain, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in eternal chains under darkness, bound for judgment on that great day. It's like, hold on, where did we learn about that? So do you want to talk about that? I do. I do want to go through the Egypt story first. Oh, okay. Yeah, I feel like going through them in an order actually heightens his, uh, what he's actually trying to say, he gets in. Do it the way he did it. Yeah, let's do it the way he did it. So there's three examples he gives out of the Old Testament from like verse five and six, I believe it is. Uh, And the first one is Israel. So they practice the sin of unbelief is really what he's getting at. So he says they were saved out of Egypt, but then those who didn't believe. And so it's a long story actually to get into uh, that he takes us all the way back to Exodus. So he takes us back to Exodus, where you can look at that the Israelites were there for 430 years. That's in Exodus 12. Uh, and while they were there, they were treated harshly, and they were used as slave labor. So they were not looked at favorably by the Egyptians and by Pharaoh, who we covered in uh, the villain series. So if mm-hmm. you want more on him, you can look at that. Uh, but God calls Moses to deliver the people out of Israel. And then really what you have is a spiritual battle between God and the gods of Egypt and Pharaoh himself, who would have deemed himself as God. So when Moses comes up to him and says, God, I am Yahweh, says, let my people go. Pharaoh's first response was, I don't know who this is. Like just the bravado and the arrogance. I know of my gods. I know that I deem myself that way, but I don't know who this is. Well, it's not even him deeming himself that way. Everyone would have. It was such a common thing back in the ancient world that the king embodied you know whoever the god was or was the son of which or whatever there was very much a tie-in with god and king being same same right yeah so kim moses coming in and addressing him that way it had i mean we look at it and like pharaoh's heart got hardened but i mean also like pharaoh was just like wait how why are you talking to me this way i'm god and here are my gods and they're the things that are important and what should be served and moses is saying nope you guys are gods. Little G, this is the big God. This the most is high. God. Yeah. And it, it's crazy, too, when you look at it, that the people started prospering almost as far as like multiplying in Egypt. The fear crept in. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, there's a lot of them. This might turn bad. This might turn bad. So they were like, you know what's okay with all of us? Let's kill the babies. Let's wipe out the babies. That's okay with us. And they, the, as a culture and society, they deemed that as okay. Um, there were some people, the midwives, who didn't. So they kept hiding the babies. But yeah, it's such a crazy thing that this evilness justified an action. That's way more into the Pharaoh and Egyptian side of it. Uh, So God attacks them using these 10 plagues. And at the end of the day, the Israelites were allowed to leave and basically plundered Egypt. Um, We don't see that that way because we just see plague, plague, plague. But plunder, taking something is usually what you do at the end of a war. And when you read the Bible and you're not reading it from that understanding that this was a spiritual war going on, when you see the Israelites just taking from the uh, Egyptians, then you don't catch that God just won a major victory there. Which, because it's beforehand, and there's a couple of different places where it's referenced, where God says, I'm going to go shut down the gods of Egypt. But then when you get into the actual narrative of the story, yeah, it's just plague, plague, plague. Mm -hmm. God's not like, hey, I'm going to come against, you know, the God of the Nile or whatever, that hippo man. (laughs) Like, you know what I mean? (laughs) Like, you're not getting that in. But I saw that in Moon Knight. (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, see, pop culture. I've seen Moon Knight. I'm aware of things. No, but it is kind of bookended by that thing. So if you're paying attention to what's going on, like you said, you see that it's the war. And it's even interesting as far as the plunder goes, because I think that the Egyptians were like, please leave, take our gold. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, it wasn't like, oh, let's go rip off the, the houses and burn everything to the ground. Like they were like, no, please leave. Your God is just like, you win. Yeah, we submit. We, yeah, you, we submit. You yeah, there's a good word. Even when they left, the, the land was barren. We talked about the locusts and we've mentioned it in previous episodes that the locusts had come in and just ravaged. Yeah, locusts are no joke. Everything. So the land was barren. The wealth was gone from Egypt. Uh, but Pharaoh decided he wasn't going down with one, uh, without a, I guess a, one last swing, 
And so he chased the, Egypt, uh, the Israelites, and this is where the story, he's chasing them down, and they're pinned. They got the Egyptian army on one end, and they got the sea at the other end, and they're just locked in. There's no getting out of it. And this is where uh, now we finally get into the unbelief that they said, why did you bring us out here? We would have rather stayed in Egypt. Why did you bring us here so that we could just die out here in, where we're at? And then, you know, Moses talks to God. God says, split the Red Sea. They split the Red Sea. They walk on dry ground in the middle of the sea. The Egyptians follow. And what I really love about that story, it says that the Spirit of God kind of went in between, mm -hmm. like the angel of the Lord went in between yeah. the Egyptians and the Israelites just to give them that breathing room to walk through. They walk through, the Egyptians come in. We've talked about this on that episode. Uh, the water comes in, takes out all the Egyptian army and Pharaoh. And then it's like, this is a great thing, right? We're celebrating. This, this should have been where the Israelites, okay, they, they have now become the kingdom of God's people. They're going to go out and follow his rules and decrees. But uh, I found it interesting as going through my study that it says three days later, they grumbled about no water. Like it was literally three days after walking through water that they said, wait, we got no water. Let's complain. And so that's what they did. Uh, and then after that, God provided water. But then after that, two months and 15 days later, they grumbled about food. So God provided the manna and quail. You think it'd be the kind of thing after just witnessing all the plagues and walking through the sea and everything that it would be like, hey, this Yahweh obviously looks upon us with favor. Moses, we're in need. Do you think you could talk to Yahweh for us rather than just like, this is horrible. We should go to Egypt and be like, hey, this God seems to take care of us. Do you mind seeing if he would take care of us in this situation? Yeah, you would think, right? Yeah. Yeah, but it just, it goes on. There's track record after track record. They again grumbled about water. Then there's a defeat of the Amicalites, and this is a huge victory. They arrive at Mount Sinai. Moses goes up to hear from God, and he's up there for 40 days and 40 nights. I'm pretty sure there's some interesting thing we could tie into that number of 40 days and 40 nights. Yeah, 40 but, is all over the place. We can but, save an episode on numerology. <laughs> yeah, that takes us down another rabbit hole. Gematria. <laughs> but when the people notice Moses, Moses isn't coming back, the first thing they were doing like, hey, Aaron, build us a golden calf. Like Moses isn't coming down. We need a God to worship. So they take the gold that they just got from mm -hmm. winning the war, that, right. that God won the war. And like, hey, you know, God just won this victory. Let's take all of this stuff and make a new God. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy. Moses comes down. He's like, I've got the Ten Commandments. The first one is, ah, oh, dang it, you're already breaking the first one. <laughs> but Aaron, sorry, I'm, Aaron's like, yep. Here's your God that took you out of Egypt. Like he's straight up saying that the calf did. <laughs> like, the crazy oh. part about this story too is that when Moses comes down, he's like, Aaron, what did you do? He was like, I threw some gold inside of the fire and, the and out, <laughs> out came a calf. It's like Reed. I'm like, Reed, what happened? He was like, well, uh, this, this. And I was like, son, just tell me the truth. I just want to know the truth. No magical like alien beam down and peel the paint off of our door in the restroom. Like that didn't happen. Like. Just Especially, we've all been kids. We all knew that it was us that peeled the paint yes. off the door. <laughs> That's how I know it was you. Yeah, I was like, I did the same thing at Grandma and Granddaddy's house. Like, come on, tell me the truth. But yeah, it, it's just so fascinating that this is what's happening. He comes down, first commandment is no other gods, and there they are breaking it. Uh, this, again, consistent unbelief, unbelief. So what happens? Moses says, who's with God? And the Levites, they step up and say, we're with God. And this is where like people look at the Bible and they're like, man, this is harsh. But understanding again, as we get through more of this book, I think you'll understand why. Uh, he tells the Levites, take swords and just walk up and down the community. And whoever dies, dies. And whoever lives, lives. And I think if I'm correct, I want to say uh, they killed about 3,000 Israelites. But these were people who were living in unbelief. Again, more happens. So much more. But you get to the very tail end when they're finally about to go into the promised land. They send in 12 spies. The 12 spies come back. 10 report that the people living there are powerful. The cities are fortified. The land will devour us. And we even saw the Nephilim there. And we'll get more into that in a little bit. And, and they just they didn't want to go into the promised land. They refused to go in. So God punished them and all the people 20 and older, except for Joshua and Caleb. Uh, they died in the desert and never entered the promised land. And so when Jude's saying, I want to remind you about how God saved them from Egypt, but then there's a bunch of people who died because of unbelief. This is what he's reminding them at, of. Right, and when you look at the way that that narrative happened, right, 
that because of the grumbling and because of the golden calf and because of the spies that went in and the responses of these people who didn't believe God, because God's plan was, hey, I'm going to take you out of Egypt. You're going to go into the promised land. Why is it called the promised land? Because I promised go way back to Abraham. Like, you guys know about this thing that's happening. You, wow, when you were in captivity in Egypt, you know, this is the destiny mm -hmm. for your people. You get to experience it. But rather than them believing that they were the people that got to experience it, which they were in the process of experiencing it, the unbelief shut it down, the unbelief shut it down. So when you can see that that's the tie-in with these false teachers in the church is that Jesus coming in with the gospel and everything that's afforded there, the verse right before that is, they turn the grace of our God into a license for immorality and they deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Man, the promise line to like, be free from the mm -hmm. bondage of sin, to walk in grace and in love and in all of these things. But you have these people that are creeping in with the unbelief and with the denial of who Jesus is, and sin is still kicking around. And right there, people aren't able to walk into this promised land of the gospel, but instead they're walking around in the wilderness of like still struggling with stuff that like they were called out of, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of tying that in with just like those people that were grumbling and, you know, keeping out of, the same thing can happen within the church. I, I think he gets to it eventually in Jude, but he says, and so were the, uh, will be the fate of like all who follow this way. Uh, when you look at it, like you're saying, unbelief will kill you in the desert. Like if you allow... It keeps you in the desert. Like yeah. it's your own choice to stay there versus the belief that God is trying to take mm -hmm. you, that God is good. <laughs> and he's rescued you out of Egypt and he's taken you into the better thing. Like you said, we, we looked at it. There was uh, the plagues and then all the stuff he did afterwards and then there was so much unbelief. Uh, I read this and I thought it was really interesting, especially the way it was uh, worded. It said, uh, God destroys the Israelites who experienced his salvation but did not faithfully believe. And that really because of the a conversation about salvation and everything and all the denominational beliefs behind it. But when we look at what happened when the Israelites left Egypt, that was salvation from bondage, from mm -hmm. slavery, from torment of a ruler, a suppressing ruler who's trying to keep them locked up where they were. And God freed them from that to take them into a land where they would have freedom to experience him in, in, a, in a more intimate, better way. But instead, their unbelief, like you were saying, kept them where they were at. And even though they experienced salvation, they still died because they, they didn't believe. Well, I think we need to move along because that story is actually in the Bible. <laughs> and we have many more points to make. They probably are a bit more out there as far as needing to bring in different information, unless yes. you have more on Egypt and whatnot. I think that to move into some other stuff, uh, I'm eager to. You're eager to? All right, go yeah. ahead. What's the next one? So now we're looking at the angels who did not stay within their own domain, but abandoned their proper dwelling. These he kept in eternal chains under darkness, bound them for judgment on that great day. So looking at those angels that didn't stay within their own domain, like, hold on, what is this? Like, I know some common thinking on it is like, is that that third of the angels that followed the, or that fell with the devil? Or, you know, what does that come into? But for as much as I can tell, this is going back to good old Genesis 6. Yes. With the, the flood narrative. And we get very little of what's happening in Genesis 6. We just get like, hey, it was in those days that uh, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they went in and cohabitated with them wink um and <laughs> you know nephilim were born to them mm -hmm. and the men of renown yeah who are the men of renown in these nephilim right and that's all that you really get and then it says and in those days men were wicked and then god wiped them out with the flood but that's all that you get genesis 6 now you go to the much debated and controversial book of first enoch and i say first enoch because there is also second and third enoch right Totally different books, totally different times when they were written and whatnot. And even when you're looking at it, first Enoch, probably, most probably, I would say, was not written by Enoch, mm -hmm. the dude who was the seventh from Adam, the father of Methuselah, the oldest dude in the Bible, all that stuff, right? So this book probably doesn't date back to then. Some of the stories coming from it might, oral history and everything else. But that's where you get these angels that, um, how does it word it? didn't stay in their own domain, but abandoned the proper dwelling. So these were part of what Daniel might call the watchers, right? Mm -hmm. But you have these sons of God who were there, and their proper dwelling was to look over the planet and to stay more in that realm. But they entered in and started messing around with humans the way that they shouldn't. 
Genesis 6 only gives the cohabitation. You get into Enoch, and all of a sudden you have them teaching weaponry, you have them teaching seduction, you have them teaching all kinds of stuff that really led men astray, which makes that part in Genesis 6 so true that men were doing wickedness. But it's kind of like, here's how that wickedness was introduced. It's almost a little bit of the equivalency of Pandora's box. Yes. You know what I mean? So we're like, oh, Pandora's box, like all of this stuff came out. So these sons of God were supposed to be good. And they obviously had this knowledge, but they stepped out of their bounds. Mm -hmm. And that's where you also get within the story of First Enoch, that their judgment coming for this is that they were bound up for later judgment. And it's really... (laughs) Sorry, I know I'm, I'm skipping through a lot of Enoch and we can talk about it. I'm just giving the broad narrative on, Don't these, worry, I'm gonna read some of on it. these points. But that when they did that and then they realized, oh, we screwed up mm-hmm. and they go to Enoch because Enoch has a special counsel with God. Like he gets traveled up into the heavens and is able to like be a part of things. because Enoch was a super righteous dude. He's one of two guys in the Bible, him and Elijah, that didn't die with Enoch. It's just like he walked with God every day of his life and then was taken up with him. He was no more. He just went straight to be with God. But when when, when these uh, fallen ones realize, oh, we messed up, they go, hey, Enoch, can you put in a good word for us <laughs> with Yahweh? Because um, can you see if we can be forgiven for this thing? And basically the answer is no, you can't. And so judgment comes on them. They get locked up. And this is where you get even coming into Peter talking about those that are locked up in Tartarus. Yeah. And also in Revelation, like in the abyss and things like that. So even references to Enoch or the understanding that's within Enoch that there were these beings from Genesis 6, the judgment that they came under was being bound until this great day. And that's where they're being held. So that's kind of some little bit of an overview coming from First Enoch. There's all kinds of other stuff in First Enoch. And that's where you get where this reference is there in Jude where there isn't much detail because, again, they know about this. Even when you're reading Genesis, it's like the mention of the Nephilim are, it's just there. Mm -hmm. There's no detail of who they are, what they came from, what they were. Uh, So we have to understand that when we're reading it, because even then it says that they were there and they were there after. Yeah, they were there in those days and also afterwards. Right. So when we were reading it, you have to understand that uh, if Moses wrote this, this was then written years hundreds of years after Noah, but this oracle story told over and over and over again, and maybe even written down in some places by other people, when the people read Nephilim, they knew. Mm-hmm. They understood what it was being talked about. They, they got it. It wasn't anything out there for them. But yeah, uh, the idea is there's, it's either giants or semi-divine beings or spiritual beings or a race of spiritual beings. But we do get into some more details with First Enoch, and I'm going to just read a little bit of chapter 6. And seven. So it says, in those days, the children of man had multiplied, and it had happened that there were born unto them handsome and beautiful daughters. So very similar to the Genesis 6, right? Oh, yeah. It's parallel, though. Yeah. Right. Uh, and the angels and the children of heaven saw them and desired them. And they said to one another, come, let us choose wives for ourselves and from among the, the daughters of man uh, and beget us children. Um, and then it goes down that they made an agreement, da, 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 da. Chapter 7, and they took wives upon themselves, and every one respectively chose one wife, one woman for himself, and they began to go unto them. And they taught them uh, magical medicine, incantations, the cutting of roots, and taught them about plants. And the women became pregnant and gave birth to these great giants whose heights were 300 cubits. These giants consumed the products of the people until the people detested feeding them. So the giants turned against the people in order to eat them. And they began to sin against birds, wild animals, reptiles, fish, and their flesh was devoured, the ones, the one by the other, and they drank blood, and the earth brought accusation against the oppressor. And then you even get into chapter 8 where it talks about Azel and some of the other ones teaching them how to make swords, knives, uh, breastplates, and uh, decorations, bracelets. Some of them even taught them... Um, incantations, the cutting of roots, like we said, and then also about the stars and astrology, and that happened, and then we get into Michael showing up and seeing all this, but it, it's a, like um, a fill in the gap for yeah. what we have. Yeah, so in looking at that, I see that those filling in the gaps, when I have a little bit limited study of like 
history and other people groups and how things come about like when it's talking about the cutting of roots and those things being taught like there's a lot of native peoples indigenous peoples that like ayahuasca or whatever they're like hey we go on these trips and the plants teach us about things because they're tapping into like a spiritual thing and they're just like the knowledge of how to do those things is like well where did that come from mm -hmm. and the knowledge of like metallurgy and of doing these different things and you can look at history towards like mankind did kind of just take a jump <laughs> <laughs> like right. even even archaeologists and stuff notice that like we kind of just went from like all of a sudden we were doing things and it's so interesting looking at even today mm -hmm. like 1960 we had nothing and then we went to the moon then we went to the moon and then maybe <laughs> and then like the first cell phone that we had <laughs> uh, then the first cell phone comes out and it's this giant brick but within years it's like the advancement of technology and what we see is just happens so quick to where now we're noticing the ramifications of how quickly we advance on depression, anxiety that is created in a lot of people and, and social issues. But it's things that happen too quickly. And that's what some people point out about the nar narrative of Enoch is that, that the human race got things way too quickly. Yeah. And I think that and was that's kind of what... our study, with our, our episode with Doug, right? When we were talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and right, evil. Yeah. It's like, maybe we could have actually gotten to the point, but we weren't supposed to yet. Like, mm -hmm. we got there too soon. And when it comes to these different things, got there too soon without having the maturity to be able to handle it. But yeah, looking at just those different things that were brought in, we can see how those things, as you said, still today, just still wreak so much havoc. And there's so much wickedness that they can be used for. It's really interesting. You talked about making gold bracelets. And it even talks about, like, I think it says, like, makeup, basically. Yeah. And when you look at just the art of seduction so to speak and not to put everything all on women because men are culpable and everything but just the thing of just purposefully making yourself to trigger not just like oh you're beautiful or let's get married or whatever but like to go that step beyond well it's the sex sells yeah but you know but so that's mm -hmm. what we're getting so it's interesting to, when i was reading it's like man this ancient thing is really like gonna call out makeup with war <laughs> but you look at the wickedness that can come from stuff and then the, the gap that's filled in there is that in Genesis comes back to where God saw this and he said, you know, this is, this is bad. So the, the days are 120. I think, what is it? Let me read it. It said, uh, my spirit will not contend with men forever, for he is mortal. His days will be 120 years. And a lot of times that's been taken as like 120 years. That's our lifespan. That's how long we're going to live or that's how long people will live. But Way after that, people are living way longer than 120 years. I heard an interesting thought that it was 120 years to the ark to when the flood would happen and that that would then wash away the people and that they would take them out. So uh, more just presenting it as another thought that's out there. Yeah, I feel like there might have been the lingering of people that were like lasting longer. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, lifespans came down to 120. Yeah, like there's no one today going beyond 120. Versus in Genesis, you have Methuselah up there, like a thousand and all that stuff, which then goes to like, how did these stories get passed down? If this is coming from Enoch, Enoch would have been alive the same time that Noah was alive and would mm -hmm. have been able to transmit these things. You know, so there's like talking about that, that here's how it could have been passed on that Noah was able to take this information. Also, just when you were reading that quote from Enoch where it says, and they sinned against the animals, like, what does that mean? Uh, that's another one of those things that gets a wink. <laughs> um, that's what that means, yeah. you know, and um, so all kinds of stuff coming from that. But when you look at, for me, this fills in the gap of Genesis 6, where it's like, hold on, how did everybody just become so wicked that now God is just so against men that, like, he regrets making them? It's like, here's how they became so wicked. And also fills in the blank that the flood was to wipe out the wickedness, but also to wipe out the Nephilim. Yeah. Even though they were there later, like you were saying, but it was to purge that wickedness out. What, the, the purge out the wickedness that they weren't supposed to have that then just completely like poisoned well, humanity. We look at all the books and we're like, where's the day of the Lord, right? And within already these two illustrations that we've covered, it's the day of the Lord. The wipe out of the Egyptians, that evil, that uh, Babylonian empire uh, mentality wiped out. And then... We have on the flip side of it then the Nephilim who also were creating havoc and creating evil that was in the world wiped out. Um, so these little days, I, I guess they would be the little Ds of Day of the Lord. And then there's the big D, which is like the, the final one. Right. So when we're talking about Day of the Lord, meaning judgment, and that's like where God comes and sets 
things right. Yes. And setting things right can seem really intense. A lot of times it's wiping out evil, Mm -hmm. which is the thing that everyone says, God, why don't you do it? And then God does it. And everyone's like, God's evil for wiping out evil. That was to me. Yeah. yeah, It's like, oh, you can't have both ways. Like, couldn't he have done it another way? And he's like, yeah, that's what the patience was for. Mm -hmm. The other way didn't work. It's kind of like with our kids. Like, I was patient. I talked nicely. You didn't listen. So consequence. But to bring this thing into where he says, so now we're talking about these angels who didn't stay in their domain, but abandoned that. And as we're talking about those things that they came and taught and also the interactions that they were having, doing all kinds of stuff they weren't supposed to, tying that back in with the false teachers, people coming in, teaching things that they shouldn't be teaching, coming in and, you know, bringing in immorality and these different things and living that way. And his point with bringing this is like, hey, remember those angels, how God judged them and they're bound up for the day Mm -hmm. of judgment. Watch out for these people calling themselves teachers because judgment also awaits them. Like the angels couldn't escape it, and these people definitely won't either. Welcome back to the heated debate for the body of Moses. I'm your moderator, Remy from YCF Kids News. Devil, why do you feel like you should have the body of Moses? Well, the body is mine because I am the master of material things. All that is in this world belongs to me. And so also does the body of this murderer, Moses. He killed a man in cold blood and hid him in the sand. No amount of good can save him from me. Michael the Archangel, what is your reply to that? The Lord rebuke you. Devil, isn't it true that you want to use the body of Moses as an idol for the children of Israel? No. That is a lie, and I would know a thing or two about lies. All I simply intend to do is bring it down to the people and let them do what they desire to do. Trust me. Michael the Archangel, what do you have to say about that? The Lord rebuke you. This debate is intensifying. We'll be back with more after this. I also saw it too this way. The the first one was the sin of unbelief. And then this one is like the sin of abandoning your post in a sense. Like this is what mm. he's highlighting. Yeah. And maybe not so much a word against the false teachers, but also against the people listening to them. Um, watch out. Don't fall into unbelief. Don't abandon your post. The whole theme behind Jude is stand firm for the truth. You don't stand firm from the truth when you, you don't believe it. And then when you abandon your post, when you run, I was just watching um, Doctor Strange, uh, the Multiverse of Madness, and when Wanda comes against all the sorcerers when they're on the at their sanctuary where they're going to protect America, Chavez, and everything, and she's like blasting them and blasting them, but they have that magic shield that's up there mm-hmm. and it's protecting them, and she's looking for one, and they're like, she's going to enter someone's mind. Dude, that one guy, and that one guy, she just comes up and creeps in, run, and he takes off running. He knocks into a few other guys, and then the shield comes down. And she was able to get in there and attack. And that's very much our enemy. Right. That prowls around. And we, we talked about mm-hmm. this on the Satan episode and others that prowling around looking for the weak one. Mm-hmm. Right. And then getting an entrance in. And yeah, it's interesting because I also I, I watch that because now it's on streaming. Right. And I was also doing other things. I was doing stuff on my computer, just on in the background. I paid attention to close to none of that movie. I know vaguely what it's about, but I looked up at that part. So I knew what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, yes. That's two for two with pop culture today. Yes. You're on a roll. Uh, before we move on, I did want to get into this. Um, uh, Father Stephen DeYoung, what would they call him? They wouldn't call themselves pastors, right? Are they? Father. Father? Priest. Right. Priest. Yeah. Uh, he mentions that, uh, that they were a giant race who did acts of great evil. We've covered that. But their great size and power likely came from them, a mixture of demonic DNA with human genetics. Uh, So I'm going to read it. I'll put the link in our show notes, too. There's some stuff that he says in there, but I'm going to read a little chunk of it because I thought it was really cool to kind of even tie in some of what we're talking about. But it said, the word Nephilim sometimes left untranslated in English. Translation of Genesis 6-4 does indeed refer to giants. Some have sought its origin in Hebrew word Nephel, arguing for the translation of fallen ones connected with the fallen angelic beings involved. The verb, however, would be the wrong conjunction and be something closer to those fallen upon. Some had advanced that translation, arguing that it is referring to the fact that the descendants of these 
beings who were attacked and slain by Israel. All of this is seen to be a special pleading, however, in the light of the fact that the Aramaic word Nephilim means giants. So he's just basically saying it's giants. Uh, this is certainly the understanding taken by the Septuagint translator who, who renders the word. Grandes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, like the English word giant. This is often a reference to physical size, but it is important to note that it can also be used to describe a tyrant or what we in modern times would call a bully or a thug. It includes both size and demeanor. By placing the word in the parallel in the text with the reference to the giborium, the mighty men, the heroes, uh, the men of great now, Genesis recast these figures from ancient tradition in the Near East as something darker, more wicked, and more brutal. So it's a lot. He even goes and talks about, uh, in the article, Og, the king of Bashan, and Deuteronomy 3 through 11. And it goes on to talk about his defeat, but it talks about his bed. Mm -hmm. And his bed is uh, 14 feet by 6 feet. And he notes that that size doesn't only suggest that Og is a giant, but it also matches exactly the dimension of the scriptures of a ritual bed found uh, in the ziggurat that is used for pagan sexual rituals. I'm trying to put winks on stuff. <laughs> yeah, you're winking, and I'm just straight up saying it. <laughs> uh, but basically that uh, he's a product of, <laughs> wink, <laughs> demonic fornication. <laughs> <laughs> no, the wink replaces that. No, but yeah, uh, yeah. When, when you're looking at that, and there's different things when you look at the quote from Enoch, 300 cubits, that's massive. Mm -hmm. And when you look at a lot of times when... Again, numbers are used in the Bible and the meaning behind things. Like, is it a literal 300 cubits? Or Because even the, the giants are talked about in different heights in other places. And it's like, it's trying to get across the point, like you were saying, that they're big or they're this. But even how you said that that word, how it's used in other places, meaning like that bully or that tyrant, and that's how they're relaying that information. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like in, in the scriptures, it was like, oh, we felt like grasshoppers in their sight. It didn't mean that you were actually, you know, a little, little tiny bug size, but you were trying to telegraph a meaning behind something. Right, that you felt small. Yeah. I've been, I know I've interjected gigantes. That would be more of the Spanish flavor on it, but mm -hmm. uh, giga meaning giant. And yeah, but you brought in the gibberim, which the gibberim meaning the mighty, the mighty men of renown, which is interesting. But when you said painting them in the dark light, um, because other, compared to other ancient Near Eastern, like you were talking about, because if you look at like Ugaritic texts and stuff where you have, what's the guy's name? Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh. Right? And you have the epic of Gilgamesh mm -hmm. and everything. He would have been like one of these mighty men. Yeah. And where you look at that narrative or you look at in the other cultures, you had those fallen creatures coming down called the Apkalu. And in those cultures, the Apkalu were good guys because they came down and gave these things to mankind. They were like mm -hmm. the... Greek mythology is the guy that brings a torch down and he's like, oh man, I stole this from heaven, but like it's for you and he gets punished for it because he shouldn't have done that thing, but he was like the light bearer. And Isn't whatever. that like the symbolism what we do for the Olympics? Bringing the torch to the thing and lighting it? I'm not sure if that's why we do that, but yeah. yeah. So, so all of these things to where they tend to look at oh, this one that comes from above that gives us this information is a good thing. That's where the scripture goes, no, 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 that wasn't a good thing. Yeah. So scripture says what you would call those apkalu, what we're calling you know, these sons of God, they did a bad thing. They left their post, as you were saying, and the Bible is trying to correct the narrative that was being spoken in those times. Yeah, just to kind of flesh out mm -hmm. even more of what you're talking about. It's the Bible doesn't stand alone in its understanding that these things took place, but it stands alone in it putting it in its proper understanding. Right. Yeah. And that's where we even look at where the giants were even later mentioned, I mean, we have Goliath who was talked about as a giant. But when the children of Israel went to the promised land, and we, which we just talked about, and they were like, no, nah, we're not going in. They said that they, we saw the um, Anak, or Anak, uh, which they were like, they, the, the descendants of the Nephilim. And so they were like, we're not going in there because that they were there. They eventually did go in, and Joshua then, in Joshua 11, takes them all out. It, it says that the, he got rid of all of them except for the ones that were in the Philistine cities of Gath, God, and Ashdod. And we know, looking at Goliath, that he was from Gath. Uh, so eventually, yeah, he was taken out. And uh, it's just a little cool note, and I don't know how much of this is true, but when he, uh, David picked up the five smooth stones, uh, one of them was Goliath, but apparently Goliath had four other brothers. Uh, that were giants as well that were then taken out by either him or his mighty men. And so some people say that he was, that's a symbolic 
thing. But that's some confidence. You're growing up against five giants. Right? I don't need five rocks. I just need five rocks. Yeah, I'm gonna take them all. And he did. I mean, he took them yeah. out. But he was relying on on God doing it, and God the one doing that. Um, th- there is one more thing that uh, Father Stephen DeYoung has. I forgot to to read this part, and it was pretty cool. It says uh, Joshua did not describe a holy war or a genocide directed at a particular mm-hmm. ethnicity or human being but a war waged by the worshipers of Yahweh, the God of Israel, against the spiritual enemies, demonic powers that had come to dominate the region of Canaan and the Transjordan. It is important to remember as we read this text as modern people, the ancient people did not have a concept of secular space. People, place, and even objects were not spiritually neutral. People, places, and objects either existed within a sphere which had been consecrated to Yahweh, the God of Israel, or they existed outside of the space under the control of the dark powers. I mean, that's a lot to go into that verse, but I feel like flushing it all out is important because it does heighten, again, what Judah's saying. They abandoned their post. They caused a ruckus. There was judgment that needed to come. Yeah, just the on that last part that you said, because I was going to bring that up anyways, and I'm glad that, because he said it in a good way and had a different perspective, but when Joshua and them went into the promised land, Again, it's one of those things that seems really brutal when you read through. Mm -hmm. Joshua and the Israelites targeted the giant clans. Yeah. They went past cities that were inhabited by other people. They only went and had that um, devoted to destruction mentality for where the giant clans were. And they went in and it had nothing to do with, well, here's everyone in the area who got to wipe them all. I was like, no, these people who are doing these demonic practices, like you said. And it really is like, Man, we live in a different world in 2022 than when we look at like, oh, what's a demonic practice or what are the other religions doing? It's like, no, no, no. Back then it was like full on human sacrifice. And as you were reading from Enoch, the drinking of blood and just all of this like straight up wicked demonic stuff. And that's where you have these people, the Israelites who were called under Yahweh and consecrated to him. It's like, yo, you got to go and stomp out this wickedness like that can't exist anymore. So that was an interesting thing that as I learned more about this thing of the giants and what it meant for Nephilim and all of that and what were their practices, it made more sense of the book of Joshua and the conquest that like, it still is pretty brutal, but it wasn't like, oh, they're just going into this new land and wiping out everybody so they can take over. It was a a lot more pointed than that. I really like the modern view things that we have to kind of change our view of how we see it today compared to them because uh, we see a lot of nationalism as as an importance of things. Um, but for back then, if, if we go with what Father Stephen de Young is saying, that the act of this ritual, this sexual ritual, made you a Nephilim. It wasn't so much a genetic thing or two parents creating like, um, I'm an American because I was born in America type thing. Um, it was an, a ritual act. That's what separated them. As were the children of Israel, what made you an Israelite wasn't necessarily you were part of the 12 tribes but you had performed circumcision. Yeah, you were brought in as a, well, you could have been born, which you would have yes. been circumcised, but you could also join in through that as a proselyte. Then you became part of, mm-hmm. yeah. And so that the war was then, like, uh, I really like the end of it. Anything outside of that space that wasn't under the control of God or Yahweh was seen as darkness. And that was what they were taking out was darkness. Again, this judgment that God was coming in and laying in there. I, I, there's two sides of this. I, I think each one, of these illustrations, there's two sides. There's the, I can abandon my post and believe something that I shouldn't. Or there's a, the warning of these people. They come in and they corrupt. They make things uh, not the way God had intended them. Like you were saying, the God comes in, day of the Lord is to set things right. And that's what Jesus did. He's, he wanted to set things right in our lives and in our hearts. There's verse 4. It says, certain men crept in among you unnoticed, ungodly ones who were designated long ago for condemnation. And just like these false teachers are designated for condemnation, uh, so are these angels, Mm -hmm. right? Again, just drawing the parallel between the two. Yeah, uh, we probably have more on Enoch. I don't know if you want to say it here or back. We'll backtrack that. Yeah, when we get to the next point. Yeah, Uh, but we should probably get into Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, and they're always mentioned together. It's Sodom and Gomorrah and then also the cities of the plains are kind of thrown in there a lot too. But Sodom and Gomorrah, just like when we look at Egypt being representative and we look at uh, Babylon being representative, Mm -hmm. Sodom and Gomorrah earned that bad title of being pretty representative that they could be mentioned right now in Jude. And it's like, you should know what this means. Yeah, and they are always mentioned together. It is Genesis 18 and 19. All right, so I'm just going to go through the story. So 
God basically comes and sits down with Abraham. He has two angels with him. They eat together. He makes the promise of what's going to happen with the with his sons. Uh, Sarah laughs, and then they're going up, and they're looking over at Sodom. It's really interesting the way he says things. So God is talking to Abraham, and he reveals that he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because the outcry against them. And that does then go back and take you to what we talked about with Cain and Abel, that Abel's blood cried out from the ground, that there was an outcry against them. Uh, that their sin was so grievous. And in Genesis 13, 13, it says uh, Sodom was a wicked place. So when Lot was pitching up tent next to them, that Sodom was not a place that you would want to go near. And then Jude mentions that they gave themselves up to sexual immorality. Uh, so like really what was their sin? And a lot of times we kind of boil it down to like, well, they wanted to have sex with the angels. And they were, some people would call it inhospitable to them. But as I started looking through, you got Ezekiel 16. It mentions that the sin of Sodom was their arrogant. They were overfed, unconcerned. They didn't help the poor or the needy, and they were haughty and did detestable things. Isaiah mentions uh, they paraded their sin and did not hide it. Jeremiah mentions that they committed adultery. They lived a lie, and they strengthened the hands of evildoers. All that is just you know, we really have the small references of what Sodom and Gomorrah, that they were sinful and that God was going down there to see how sinful they really were. Like if the outcry was worthy of destruction, almost again, like when he came down for the Tower of Babel type thing. But I like going through and looking at what the prophets had to say about them, because it does kind of then feed a little bit more into why these cities and the surrounding cities around them were destroyed. Uh, because, I mean, look at this list. It's it's nothing, I mean, yes, we have the sexual morality part, but then it's like they were arrogant. They were overfed. They were unconcerned. Um, they didn't help the poor or the needy. They were just proud of what they were doing. Even to where, uh, so we have the back and forth between Abraham and God about like, hey, if there's 50, 40, 20, 10, and God's like, I won't destroy it. But apparently he didn't find enough of those. Enough he, of those righteous people. Righteous people, yeah. yeah. Um, so they go in there to do it. But even to where, there was no shame in the men when they were like, bring those guys out here so we can have sex with them. Like they were that haughty and that proud of what they were doing. Uh, eventually, Lot is taken out, him and his family, they all, they get all leave. Uh, Lot's wife looks back and turns into a pillar of salt. The hammer drops and it says that the Lord rained down sulfur, burning sulfur, and that the next day Abraham woke up in the morning, looked towards Sodom and saw a dense smoke kind of like rising from a furnace. And Jude says that the judgment of these, uh, these cities uh, is an illustration of what hell would be like in those areas. But that's just a quick run through of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and what it led to and why it was destroyed. Yeah, that was pretty thorough and quick going through all of that. And yeah, a lot of time people want to just narrow down the sin to the sexual sin because that was pretty apparent. But when you get the broader scope of things, going through Ezekiel and other places that you realize they were just an ungodly people and yeah. that those are the symptoms of being an ungodly people, right? And I think that that shouldn't take away from the fact that like, hey, there was a sexual sin there. It's showing that an ungodly people exhibit these kinds of things. Right. So if you're finding these kinds of sins amongst you and, like, you know, the haughty and the proud and inhospita inhospitable? Being inhospitable. I can't. Spitable? Can't spit it out, then hospitable. Mm -hmm. All right, there we go. Being that, yeah, you don't want to be marked by that. And especially when you get a lot of these studies that want to go into the inhospitable route, that actually really opened my eyes to the fact that hospitality is a huge thing in the Old and the New Testament. Mm -hmm. It's actually a super, super, super important thing. And it's also one of those things that is kind of a bit unspoken in the Bible just because it was expected and people knew it. It was a cultural type thing. But especially in America, we don't have that same understanding. So we're kind of, we can be lacking that, you know, when we read the Bible, but looking at being inhospitable, like that's a big sin. That's a big marker of being ungodly is not showing hospitality. And you can see that even in God's law when he gives it to the Israelites. Of, hey, when you're here, when there's foreigners in your land or you're whatever, like you need to treat them right. And when you look at what treating people right, like just the hospitality part. So I like that we can get a more complete view that is mm -hmm. not just like, oh, yeah, the sin of Sodom was sodomy. Right. <laughs> like, you know, but because included, it, included that. I, I really like what you were saying there, too, because what it really brought it to was like there was just a list of immoral behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so what was their mistake or what was their sin if you, we were to like put it in that text was immoral behavior, even to the point where you see Lot uh, who 
when we look take at my daughters, yes, where in Second Peter he will be called a righteous man. But yeah, he said, take my daughters instead. Like that's the immorality that causes you to kind of live in it, um, which is why the judgment had to come. Like God walked in there, he saw what was happening, and then here comes the burning sulfur to burn up the city and everything to, to take it down. Which again, I, I really feel like these three stories are so quickly mentioned in the book, book of Jude are warning after warning after warning after warning. This is what false teachers go after. So they want you to, be, to, to doubt. They want to cause unbelief. They, they want you to abandon your post. So they want you to run when things don't look right. And they also eventually want you to join them in their moral, immoral behavior, uh, which then causes God's judgment. God coming in and saying like, hey, this isn't right. Uh, but it takes you down a path of destruction. All three paths of destruction. It was destruction, destruction, and destruction. And, and that's really where it leads. And that's why Jude mentioned it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So briefly, but like, again, we have to thoroughly flush it out because as people reading that, we're not going to put two and two together. We're not going to go backwards and look or look at some of the other things, which well, kind of... Thankfully, us... these ones were in the Old Testament. Yes. So it's a little bit easier to, to put it together. It is, when you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, most people will have somewhat of an understanding, but yeah, to, to flush it out more and see what's going on there. That takes us to question number five, though. What's up with the, the debate about Moses' body? Before that, just I want to go back okay. to the thing of saying that they indulge in sexual immorality, pursued strange flesh on displays of examples. Again, just false teachers coming into the church and turning the grace of our God into a license for immorality. And this is where Jude is saying, hey, the sexual immorality coming in, that's a pretty big stain on the church in our day, mm. is the sexual immorality. And especially a lot of it gets put on leaders, which again, false teachers coming in and what happens through all that and to really take a look and to be accountable for those things. But we can see that this was a warning given at the very beginning of the church starting was look out for these people because these things can come from it. And I think that for the church today to really look at that, it's like, yeah, that's a really bad thing. And none of us as Christians want that to happen to anybody that we know. Uh, so just when we're looking at these things, I mean, I know that the more pastoral look at it, but yeah, that tie in with the false teachers, like the, we can see that that's where people end up in. Like that's a, an apparent thing. But yeah, let's go into the next part. Yeah, next one. Uh, Moses and the debate with Michael and the body of Moses and the devil. Um, yeah, that's totally in um, that book in the Old Testament. <laughs> that, that's the other forgotten book, right? That's yeah. in between that one and that one. That one, that one. So yes, the, the actual account of what Jude lays down isn't found in any works of the Bible that we have. So that's not going to be in any of the 66 books. Uh, even the actual ancient books, it's really been lost. This portion of the story has been lost. And uh, one of the early church fathers says that it came from one of the works of either the Ascension of Moses or the Testament of Moses or the Assumption of Moses. I really think it falls more into the Assumption of Moses because this is the part that they didn't have or there was the when they found the scrolls, it was all jacked up and broken up. I think Assumption and Ascension are just two titles for the same, same thing, thing right? right? Yeah, so it comes from that. But uh, we have this debate, and um, Michael's there. So who is Michael? Michael is one of only, and I didn't know this. Two. Two angels. They get mentioned in Scripture. Right. The other being? Gabriel. Gabriel. Yes. Right? Uh, so Michael is there, and just for the fun of it, Michael's name is who is like God for all the people choosing names for their babies and listening. And to go a little bit further, when you say who is like God, whenever you see God as a name meaning, mm -hmm. it's because it ends in L. L is the ancient name for God. Oh, I didn't. So you yeah, have yeah, like yeah. Mikael, yeah. Gabriel, right? Mm -hmm. So whenever there's an L, when you're reading in an Old Testament name, you can say that, oh, that name has something to do with God. Ah, pretty cool. Uh, baby name. Baby <laughs> name. <laughs> That's the alternate meaning for this, uh, <laughs> alternate name for the series. Uh, so he's mentioned in Daniel as uh, Israel's angel, Israel's prince, uh, their protector, and the one who fights uh, the prince of the kingdom of Persia. So the first reference of Michael is in Daniel. And you get some of that. He's also then mentioned in Revelation, which we covered when he is fighting Satan, the dragon, and all of his armies, and he kicks their butts and throws them in the thing. Uh, but Jude's reference here is the burial of Moses, which is Deuteronomy 34, 6. Uh, and so the story, when I actually listened to it and heard what a few other people said and read, is the story is this, that Satan wants Moses' body 
to take it back down to the Israelites because he knew that if he took them Moses' body, that would become an idol for them. Kind of like the bronze serpent? Yes. Yeah. So he, he did that, um, and he wanted to use it to lead them astray. Uh, so Michael, during this entire time, is like debating with him about it, uh, is basically saying, the Lord rebuke you, the Lord rebuke you, the Lord rebuke you. And then at some point he says, uh, you are a liar from the beginning and you're a liar now. So that's the story that they that they have that I was able to kind of find from all the pieces of it. That, that was a kind of hard one to yeah. get information on as far as extra biblical sources and stuff. Mm-hmm. There's not really too much on the assumption or the testament of Moses. Um is it an alternate view of, I don't know if it's an alternate view, but just looking at why would the devil want the body? It's not flat out said because it would cause idolatry. You know, that's one of the yeah. assumptions put in there. Um, there's also the view of when you're looking at Satan is somewhat like the, to term it loosely, the God of the dead, so to speak. Like that's his domain. So it's like, hey, that guy died. He's mine. And kind of like, quote unquote, claiming what's his in that sense. But we also have an interesting thing that Moses' body was hidden away. And then the next time that you see Moses' body is on the Mount of Transfiguration. Yeah. And he shows up with Elijah, whose body also didn't see death. So there's, you know, some even talk mm-hmm. on these two coming up in their bodies and the fact that the devil wouldn't have gotten those bodies. I don't know, just interesting things to, yeah, to think yeah. of. Um, but yeah, it's not directly said, but the point there being is that Michael didn't say, oh, man, I'm big and tough, whatever. He's like, I'm going to let the Lord judge you on this one. I'm not in the place to judge you on this one. Yeah, he recognized his place and allowed God to do the judging. Um, And really the restraint that he showed with the devil. uh, I read this and it said that the false teachers exhibit no reverence for authority and no restraint for that. But here you see the opposite of Michael, who in the way he says it is right, like not even the archangel, Michael, who has the power, who had the ability to, to say something slanderous against uh, Satan. He didn't do it. He just said, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. He left it up, up to God. So uh, Michael allowed God to do the rebuking in that situation. And really, again, just an interesting little story. Yeah. Just when we were talking about Michael being like the prince of Egypt, and we look at that thing earlier, you referenced that for ancient people, there was no such thing as secular ground. Huge thing, really interesting thing for people to get in and study is the idea of sacred geography, sacred space. And again, being consecrated for, for God. That's where you get Israel being a holy nation, that the ground there and everything. And if you go outside of the nation, it's like, quote unquote, ground belonging to other gods or under the dominion of. So that's where you get Michael being the archangel or the prince over eat over almost said Egypt over Israel, and then you have another angelic being that would be over Persia, and this is happening in the spiritual plane of things mm-hmm. to where we see the geography of just oh yeah we drew lines on a map or whatever, but when we look at being under the dominion of different spiritual forces and get into the gospel going out and the effects of the gospel and all of that. Like, that's an interesting thing as far as where is sacred space now? Well, where is the church? And, you know, it's, it's fun stuff. But I, I wonder, and this just kind of struck me as you were talking about that, looking at all the examples that we've looked at and all the things that we've talked about for this episode so far, it was like a spiritual battle in every single one behind the scenes, mm-hmm. behind the scenes. And I wonder if Judas taking his readers, his audience, to let them know false teachers, it, yes, it is a physical person. But the battle is spiritual. It is a spiritual battle that's going on. And the reminding they're them being of this. influenced by. Yeah. Which I think that when we get into Balaam and Cain and everything there, you know, we see that as well. I also wanted to say, though, that they didn't presume to bring slanderous charge against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But then he's referencing these false teachers saying, These men, however, slander what they don't understand. And like irrational animals, they'll be destroyed by the things they do instinctively. This is where I would probably want to put a thought out there for our charismatic brothers and sisters, is that they're very popular within that denominational purview to get into these spiritual battles and to be going and calling out like, demon, tell me your name and all Mm -hmm. of this stuff and going in. And Michael didn't take that on, said the Lord rebuke you. And I know that Some people, depending on what your experience is, oh, yeah, that's what we do. Like, we say that the Lord rebuke and different stuff. It's like, just be very careful 
because that's the parallel that's getting drawn here. Like, hey, Michael didn't go and rebuke, like, but these people don't know these men, these certain men, like, right, these false teachers, they don't know what they're talking about. And they go beyond and they're slandering what they don't understand. So when we're looking at these um, powers and principalities and high places and different stuff that's happening in the spiritual realm, it's like, we really don't understand all too much. What we do understand is that we can come under the Lord and that he protects and he's the refuge and he's the one that rebukes and the things like that. I guess just we should be very careful not to step out of the bounds because if these forces are real, which I believe that they are, then there can be real consequences for yeah, them. Yeah, that's a really good point. And that's just a big thing that I'm not going to say that all charismatic teachers or the false teachers look out or whatever, but just especially now there's a really popular thing going around that for teachers to be I'm, I'm sure that you've seen it on youtube and different stuff and we're aware of some of these teachers and stuff but it's um just be careful when you're messing around in this realm uh, messing around puts it too lightly it's a, it's a serious thing like there are people who are coming under um the dominion and under the control and like oppression from spiritual forces just be careful how you're doing it that you're not just getting in and uh getting in something that you don't understand and that you'll be destroyed by things that you think that you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point to bring up. I'm glad you brought that up. So we got through like one question. We, went, we covered all kinds of different yeah, stuff. Yeah, we covered a bunch of different stuff, but we got through one question. We'll take care of the rest on the next episode um, because we're way past our time. But this is the fascinating part of the Book of Jude. This is why I think we, we broke it down a little bit more than some of the other ones. Uh, even though I love Haggai and probably could talk about that all day, Jude, there's more that you need to get into. There's a reason why people wanted to take it out of canon, and there's a reason why it's actually placed in it, uh, because it has so much to offer. Within these small verses, it's just punch after punch after punch. Remember this, remember that. False teachers are this way, false teachers are that way. I'm not going to tell you who, but I'm going to tell you what they look like. And I'm going to remind you of what things have happened before so you could see the characteristics of it today. And he's pulling up some pretty serious stuff. Oh, yeah. Very serious. As far serious. as referencing, he's just like, hey, these are big things for a reason. Yeah. Everyone died. Like a whole generation of people died in the desert. Um, you have angels who, who have fallen, created a bunch of ruckus, and now are in a place of waiting their judgment. So when you look at what he's drawing parallels to, it's just like, oh, this false teacher thing is not good. Yeah, it creates corruption. And it, more than just someone who's coming in and saying something that's slightly different than what the Bible says, it's someone coming in and really trying to destroy what God has established. I know that we're ending, but I just want to put this thing in here because it fits right now, is that it's so interesting to me that Jude being a book that's calling out false teachers and warning against all of that so much is referencing things that if a pastor was to get up today and try teaching from the book of Enoch <laughs> or teaching teacher, from the yeah. assumption of Moses or whatever, other than trying to give a little bit of background, but even that might be questionable, but depending mm -hmm. on how fundamental you are, right? Is that that would get you pegged as a false teacher. And it's just like, is that what gets you pegged as a false teacher? Because Jude seems pretty straight and narrow on what this thing is, and he seems kind of okay with these books, not saying that those books need to be in the Bible, but the understanding that can come from it, right? It's just an interesting thing to me. It's just like, who are we heretic hunting and why? Yeah. And obviously don't want to go off into the weeds with this stuff as we're talking about the rabbit trails, but um, let's just make sure that we are judging right. Lee, by the we, right standards yeah you exactly. know if it's it has to be based off biblical truth you know if you're not if you're heresy hunting or looking after looking and chasing after false teachers uh just because you don't like the person or maybe they're successful and you don't think that they should be or they have lots of money or what have you their congregation is huge that shouldn't be our purpose our purpose should be to point out what they're saying and how it's leading people astray for letting people know what the truth is. And, and ultimately, um, I really like what Jude does here is that there isn't any name dropping. It's just, here's what you watch out for. Here's what you watch out for. Here's what you watch out for. And I'm going to give you, I think it's six or seven Old Testament illustrations to prove this point. So that way you can see really the character and the fruit of this, this false teacher. Right, which this will really be my last thing, but just looking, as you were saying, um, leading people astray with heresy is for us to get a better idea of heresy because even back in the early church days, not everybody held to the same doctrine, so to speak. 
There were people with some different beliefs trying to work through understanding what all of this meant. And throughout the centuries, the church is kind of like, there's been different pockets with different understandings. But heresy is a teaching that will lead people outside of the believing community to live in a way that's outside of what a gospel community mm-hmm. should be. So that's where these false teachers bring in stuff that would lead into immorality and would lead into these other areas that are illustrated by this stuff. Like that's where you can see heresy coming in. It's not just like, well, hey, how do you how do you view this sect of this part of scripture, like having to do with baptism and what does that really look like? If the church can stay together, even though it's like, oh, it's a different opinion. I can see how you can get to that mm-hmm. conclusion. I don't necessarily. But if you start trying to pull people away to go and live in a different way, and like we're saying, that poison of false teaching starts coming in and starts infecting, and, and like that's heresy. Yeah. It's what's like the result behind it. And one can lead to the other. But differences in doctrine, I think, um, again, hop on YouTube and you just see a bunch of people getting beat down for having a difference in doctrine. Mm-hmm. But what's the fruit, as you were saying? Yeah. Are people... Um, seeking after Jesus? Are they living lives of repentance? Is there the fruit of the Spirit there? You know, these are good markers to have, even if they might have a little bit of a doctrinal difference than you. If those things aren't there, it's like, whoo, okay. What's, yeah. What's up with this? I, I really like the way you put that. It's leading you almost like we were saying what the what the giants and everything did is the the sphere of what was mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. the community was wherever God deemed this is the community, this is the space. Uh, this is where God reigns and is in control. Everything outside of that is darkness. Mm-hmm. And uh, a false teacher is going to try to take you to the darkness. It's not going to constantly point you towards God, because if he's pointing you towards God, you're going to find God, and you're going to know God. But if he's pointing you towards other things like immorality, give in to your sexual pleasures, because that's way more exciting than not, and going out and fornicating and having sex with whoever and whomever, and all those other things, wink, wink, uh, that's better than chasing after the way God wants it and how God has orchestrated it for your life. That's what they're going to do. They're going to have you chase things the way the darkness wants you to chase after them. It's a spiritual battle, and it's a spiritual world out there. And if we could really see to the spiritual, we'll get a better sense of what's going on. Uh, so, yeah, that's it for me. Let's wrap this one up. I am Chris. I'm Nirlich. We are Your Church Friends. Thanks for listening. Nahum, Obadiah, Jude, Philemon, Haggai, Amen.